and um, how both progressive uh, religionists and secularists are working together to try to defend constitutional values and the real uh, freedom of conscience and religious exercise in America. So we've got uh, a tremendous lineup for you today, beginning with um, my own constituent, uh, Reverend uh, uh, Ginny Gerbasi, who lives in Maryland's 8th District in Silver Spring. She's a Blair High School mom. She's a rector at the St. John's Episcopal Church, although not the one across from the White House, the, the St. John's Episcopal Church in Georgetown. She used to work at the one um, across uh, the street from the White House and was actually there uh, when the secret police riot took place on June 1st of 2020. And so I've asked her to give both uh, an eyewitness testimony about what happened there and to discuss this uh, whole extraordinary episode that has um, captured the imagination of the country, but then also use that to talk about its implications and its meanings generally for um, religious people and the role of faith today in American politics and public life. Um, Next, we have my uh, colleague and my dear friend, Congressman uh, Jared Huffman, who is a, a congressman from California. He serves on the Natural Resources Committee where he is a, a leading environmentalist and uh, uh, determined to deal with uh, climate change and uh, air pollution and water pollution and all of the threats to the environment. He's also on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. So his committee assignments really put him at the absolute vortex of uh, dealing with the infrastructure crisis uh, in a way that advances our green and environmental priorities, which is something we have talked about before in Democracy Summer. Um, he is the co-founder with me of the Secular Caucus uh, in Congress to uh, uphold the separation of church and state, to defend constitutional values, and to defend the role of public morality, morality defined not in sectarian religious terms, but in terms of moral and ethical inquiry related to actual consequences of our public policy. So uh, we welcome Representative uh, Huffman. And finally, last but not least, we've got um, our beloved friend, Rabbi David Saperstein, who uh, is the Director Emeritus of, um, uh, of the, formerly he was the Director of uh, the Religious Action Center. Uh, he of course appears in his personal capacity today, but he was also President Obama's ambassador at large for international religious freedom and defended a very aggressive program of uh, trying to protect religious freedom, um, freedom of conscience, freedom of thought, freedom of expression all over the world. So we couldn't have three better people to talk about the subject of right-wing religion in America, what it's doing to our politics, uh, what agenda it's advancing, and to talk about the different streams of uh, political uh, in philosophical thinking among progressives uh, about this issue. So um, uh, the, uh, you know, life has begun to imitate uh, democracy summer. So it was yesterday that President Trump uh, decided he would declare that President Biden uh, hates God and uh, will hurt God and will hurt the Bible. I was wondering what uh, Reverend uh, Gervasi thought about, about that one. This from the guy who took somebody else's Bible and waved it over his head like an idiot in the most grotesque photo opportunity in American history after unleashing his uh, tear gas pepper spray and uh, horseback rampage against uh, 2000 civil rights protesters. So I want to hear generally about that. And Reverend uh, Gerbasi, if you would start and just give your perspective on the events of June 1st and then talk outwards, we'll give each of you eight to 10 minutes and we'll save the final half hour for questions from our Democracy Summer fellows. Please take it away. Sure, sure. so let me start by saying, um, I'm so glad to be here. I'm so glad to be invited into this larger conversation. I am an Episcopal priest and I went down to St. John's Lafayette Square, which for those of you who don't know by now is directly across Lafayette Park from the White House. And I went down there with a, a bunch of my clergy colleagues to be a presence of peace for frankly, the white Christian church to show up on issues of uh, opposing systemic and institutional racism and in support of Black Lives Matter and to be a presence of peace where 
the protests um, arising out of the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others were beginning to get more and more tense. And so we were there on the patio of St. John's Lafayette Square, which is takes up almost the whole corner of 16th Street right across from the White House. We were doing the things you would expect basically a bunch of moms to do, uh, handing out water bottles and granola bars and um, telling people to be careful and put on sunscreen and use hand sanitizer. And we were a place of respite when people wanted to get out from the sun or stop and have a drink of water or something. Um, we were also, as part of our Christian witness against violence against innocent people and Christian witness in support of the dignity of every human being, we were there standing up for what's right. And there were people who were moved to tears that the white church was finally showing up. And I frankly said to people so many times, I can't even remember, we may be 400 years too late, but at least we're here. Um, people don't think Episcopalians pray in public, but people were asking us to pray for them. And we were um, praying for people. It was, um, it was progressive Christianity in action in that space. I said later that we had created holy ground where everyone was welcome and it was a place and a presence of peace. And my colleagues and I had agreed we would stay there um, while we were needed to help the place be peaceful and while we could be supportive. And the, during the whole day, it was uh, joyful. It was, it was the world, it, you know, it was American values at their best, you know, this incredibly diverse community holding signs and chanting and being there in support of our brothers and sisters of color and against the use of violence against peaceful people. And then um, you've seen the videos. You may have been one of the, I don't know, half a million people that saw my Facebook post, um, but sometime before 6.30, when the protest had continued to be peaceful, there was a chain, like a flipping of a switch. We heard no announcement, there was no violence. And suddenly in the blink of an eye, the police were shooting tear gas. Now I got criticized in the days that followed saying that it wasn't tear gas. And my response was, well, I'm not a chemist. I didn't take a sample. And when they said it was just pepper spray, it's also not okay to spray spray pepper spray at innocent people. But what unfolded over the next, say, 20 minutes was a complete and utter shock. And I saw it with my own eyes. And I was literally wiping away people's tears when a wall of police came onto the patio of St. John's Lafayette Square and literally literally cleared the patio, cleared, they were clearing the entire area with tear gas, rubber bullets. It's important you know that they're not made of rubber. They're rubber coated bullets and now people are calling them less than lethal ammunition. But I saw a man right in front of me bent over in pain. And when he stood up, there were marks all over his chest, indentations from where these bullets had hit him. Well, and Judy, if I can interrupt you for one second, yeah. uh, when I had you come testify before the Oversight Subcommittee on Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, uh, we recorded nine different episodes where people had lost eyes to rubber oh. bullets across the country. Yeah, um, these so caused nine serious different Americans injuries. Have lost their eyes. Yeah. Yes. So, so after this, so I, along with hundreds and hundreds of other protesters, were pushed off the grounds of St. John's Lafayette Square and out of the streets and back several blocks with tear gas, rubber coated bullets, police on horseback, police in riot gear. It was, oh, the flash grenades where people were dropping to the ground thinking they were uh, being shot. People were terrorized. And I stayed as long as I could helping clear people's eyes, doing what I could. 
when I heard later, because of course it sounded and looked and smelled like a war zone. I was coughing, hacking, uh, had a headache for hours. I mean, I had to wash the tear gas out of my hair. Um, when I was on the way back to my car, which was still 15 minutes before the curfew was supposed to hit, people were texting me saying, are you still there? Is the president really coming? And I knew the president couldn't possibly be coming because what I heard behind me sounded like warfare with the flash grenades and the tear gas and people screaming. And it was, it was terrifying. When I heard later that he had literally cleared the space so he could take a photo holding a Bible, that's when I got really pissed because holding a Bible in a space after you have cleared it with violence violates everything in that Bible. It violates all principles of human decency. And when, and it was a clear message to this sort of Christian nationalism that has arisen in our country. It was a message to that group. And for my brothers and sisters of color, holding up a Bible after having just cleared the space with violence and fear and terrorism would have, and, and then holding up a Bible would have been a clear message because the Bible has been used, was used by white people and the white church for centuries to justify slavery. And it was another act of religious sacrilege. I see it as part in sort of moving out from that day. I see it as part of a movement linking, dangerously linking religious ideas with political power. And I think that has been a, a sacrilege in the Christian church since the year 300. It's a dangerous mix of power and religion. I would also say it represents a Christianity that I would call puny. Many people don't even know there is something like progressive Christianity, as if it's something we've just invented. But progressive Christianity more widely, I would say, and this is a super uh, abbreviation of it, but I would say looks more at the life and ministry of Jesus. What did he do? What did he say? What did he stand for? How was his life and ministry in continuity with his Jewishness? How, how does that message bring us hope? We look to the words and ministry of Jesus as part of the big picture and not just a more narrow view of um, this uh, theology that says Jesus's real value was that he died on the cross and it's for my own individual salvation. That's of less interest to me than what my Christianity, what my faith can do to help people now. And I think I have used up exactly 10 minutes. Yep. Jamie, is it my turn? It is indeed. Okay. Well, it's great to be with all of you. And uh, let me just say how honored I am to be part of uh, this excellent panel and to follow the Reverend's incredibly thoughtful remarks just now. I guess nominally I'm, I'm the secular uh, part of, of this panel, but I will start by uh, praising the higher authority that has brought us together, Jamie Raskin. Um, Jamie is uh, just an incredibly great colleague. Uh, he brings a brilliance and a, a high level of scholarship uh, and uh, intellectual firepower to his work in the Congress. And for everybody that's participating in this seminar, and Jamie, what a great idea to put this together for the benefit of not just your constituents, but for this growing community of interest beyond your district. Um, this is an incredibly uh, vital moment to be in the public arena. There's so many uh, historic uh, mm -hmm. crises that are intersecting and uh, it can be a little overwhelming, but I, I hope your constituents appreciate, Jamie, that every single day 
you step into that arena with a, a spring in your step and a twinkle in your eye. Uh, Jamie is just a great guy to have in the United States Congress in this moment, and, and I uh, love serving with him. Now, um, why the heck am I on this panel of really smart uh, people and great people of faith? Uh, I had a personal journey um, away from religion, um, a longer story than you have time or interest for, I'm sure. Uh, but it culminated in me a few years ago becoming uh, the only openly non-religious or non-theistic member uh, of the United States Congress. And um, that got a little bit of attention and some secular groups came to me and began discussing the possibility of forming uh, a caucus um, within the house that would be a bit of a counterweight to all of these different religious caucuses and nonprofits. You know, I, I'm gonna use quotation marks for nonprofits for some of these uh, that, pro that are doing so much uh, to drive public policy and frankly, foreign policy, our national security policy uh, with a strong religious uh, bent to it. And so uh, I reached out to my friend, Jamie Raskin, and uh, together, along with a few other colleagues, we came up with this idea of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus. That's what we have officially called it. We, um, we work together to uh, write amicus briefs in important court cases where there are um, religious liberty issues at stake, where uh, the line of separation between church and state uh, is uh, in jeopardy. Uh, and other important matters. Uh, we work with outside secular groups and there is a growing secular coalition in this country. And um, going forward, you know, I've talked to some of those secular groups and some of my colleagues in the Free Thought Caucus about how, how we can be as effective as possible. And that's why I'm glad uh, to be here with leaders of faith uh, on your panel, Jamie, because my message back to them is whenever we can make this an interfaith coalition, we're all stronger for it. Um, and I think the secular community gets that. They're happy to work with progressive Christians and Jews and, and others that uh, that share our opposition to this creeping theocracy that we see in our country right now. Uh, and I was so pleased with the way the Reverend uh, described that terrible incident in Lafayette Square. Uh, I feel like it was one of many incidents that have sort of motivated me to work more in this space because I see religion being weaponized and exploited and, uh, you know, from the reverend's perspective, cheapened. Uh, from my perspective, uh, dragging our government further down that slippery slope of theocracy. So I think we have a lot of important work to do together. I'm really pleased to be doing it with you and with thoughtful members of the faith community. I think I'll leave it at that and um, be happy to jump into wherever your questions take us. I think you're muted, Jamie. Sorry about that, uh, Jared. Thank you for uh, for those excellent remarks, and uh, we'll turn now to Rabbi David Saperstein. Well, what a delight to be here uh, to hear the vivid imagery that Reverend Jeannie uh, de de described to us and the inspiring message. And I thank both of the members of Congress here for your uh, incredible leadership on so many issues that are vital to a progressive agenda in America um, and prevailing in American political life. Um, we're at a crossroads in America and we need that leadership more than ever today. Um, and Jamie, I thank you for your longtime friendship and uh, uh, the, the really just brilliant way that so often you cut through complex issues and lift them up so vividly to the American, uh, to the American people. Um, I'm honored to be here. Uh, much of my life has been devoted to the issues that are on the agenda of this conversation, not only my role as the U.S. ambassador, but for nearly 30 years, I taught church state law at Georgetown Law School, um, served on the executive boards of People for the American Way and the boards of a number of other organizations, civil rights um, and uh, uh, religious freedom organizations. Um, uh, so these are issues clearly dear to my heart. And therefore, I just want to recognize what we're dealing with now is not new. We've been in battle for the soul of America on the issue of the proper place of religion, whether or not the image of the, the pilgrims would prevail, that this is a Christian nation um, uh, uh, based on a new covenant with God, 
or the image of the framers of our fundamental um, uh, documents um, uh, here are, are, are going to prevail. Um, uh, here, the notion in religion in the Constitution of the United States, there's not a word about Christianity. God doesn't appear in the Constitution, only in the date, in the year of our Lord, etc. Um, uh, uh, here, it was intentionally made as a non-religious document in order to set forth fundamental rights that accrued to everyone. The genius of America was precisely in the bar against the religious test for office and against establishment of religion, the promise of religious freedom was to create for the first time in human history, a nation in which your rights as a citizen would not depend on your religious beliefs, your religious practices, your religious identity. And that is given Jews, that's given religious minorities, that's given Catholics more freedoms here in the United States than we have known outside of lands that weren't single issue countries with established religions benefiting those who were the established religion, um, but not the minorities at those times. Um, this is an extraordinary country in this regard. And those who argue that separation of church and state is somehow anti-God or anti-religious simply distort the entire history of this country. It is precisely that wall that has kept uh, government out of religion that has allowed religion to flourish with the diversity and strength in America, unmatched anywhere in the democratic world today. The only thing that approximates this is India and India is being riven by uh, uh, political differences, by religious differences, precisely because its democratic government is choosing up sides on religion, identifying with extremist forms in the Hindu um, uh, community here. Um, there are far more people who believe in God in America, far more people go regularly to worship, far more people who hold religious values central to them according to every public opinion poll than any other democratic country in the world, precisely because of that separation of church and state. Now we have had in the last 40 years, um, a, 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 a see, we've seen a rise again, um, a form of fundamentalist religion that claims to know alone what God wants for America, claims this is a Christian country, and therefore Christians, to quote Ralph Reed in a political rally for evangelicals to Trump just two, um, just two uh, weeks ago, um, uh, here he stood up and concluded that, uh, concluded that conference um, by saying that we now have a big job to do. Um, uh, here, let's go out and do it not only to re-elect President Trump, but to glorify God and make sure that Christians are the head and not the tail, are the top and not the bottom of our political system. Um, here they try to do it by imposing prayer in our public schools, religious messages in public places. Um, they want it to be Christian messages um, uh, here, and it would distort what has made America great. They are also manipulating politics to politicize religion. And every time divisive language over religion divides America, every time they suggest that they know that God wants this candidate and not that candidate, um, I hear every time in the, in the expression of dominionism, um, I hear a form of Christian nationalism in America, they want to create a Christian theocracy in this country. Um, it is an abandonment and betrayal of everything that has made um, America great. Um, here again, just uh, Paula White at that same conference. She is an evangelical leader who is very criticized by a lot of mainstream evangelical leaders as a heretic and a charlatan, but she is President Trump's key advisor um, on religion. And she uses that kind of language all the time. And others at the rally talk about those who are demons and Satan as agents of Satan. And whenever that happens, here, what it does is to delegitimize the humanity of those who hold religious differences, uh, demonize the re political message of those who hold messages uh, with which they di uh, disagree. And that undermines democracy and it damages religion. So this is an important fight that we are in right now. Um, and one in which I hope that the traditional vision of the framers of our constitution, of our declaration of human rights, 
um, that see that religion is separate from the state. State has to be neutral on religion so that you can make your religious decisions without coercion of any kind. That's the belief in religion that we care so deeply about. And when we see today religion used and claims of religious freedom used to actually eviscerate the structure of civil rights with an argument that it doesn't matter if for COVID-19, the safety of the people require not having group meetings, their religious right to have a group meetings, even if it spreads the disease, should prevail. And their religious belief that they can discriminate against uh, people in the LGBTQ community, against women, um, against other um, uh, groups in this country who they don't want to deal with, they don't want to hire for the jobs that they're employers of, they don't want to accommodate um, uh, in, the, in their workplace. Um, uh, here, when they say that they can eviscerate the civil rights protections about it, is there any more compelling interest that we have in America than the entire scheme and structure of civil rights that ensures that people will not face discrimination and persecution, including religious discrimination? That's what's at stake in the Battle of America. So, Jamie, thank you for the opportunity to raise these issues um, to those on this webinar. Um, I hear, I think all of us believe the framers had it right. Rabbi Saperstein, thanks for that terrific presentation and your wonderful contributions, continuing contributions to uh, discourse around the separation of church and state. I just want to add uh, two points before we open it up to uh, the fellows. One, as, uh, as Rabbi Saperstein pointed out, uh, the, this struggle is not a new struggle. It goes back to the very beginning. In fact, it was really... Um, I think the most revolutionary feature of the American Constitution and the American Revolution that our uh, founders broke from centuries of religious warfare between the Catholics and the Protestants in Europe that uh, were every bit as violent and bloody as the wars between uh, Sunni and Shia today in the Muslim world. Um, and they rebelled against Inquisition and Holy Crusades and witchcraft trials and the whole merger of church and state. And they said that central to the enlightenment is that we would have government organized around reason, empiricism, science, and people bring their values from all different kinds of perspectives, but that we're gonna leave, as Madison put it in his uh, memorial and remonstrance against religious taxation in Virginia, as he put it, we're gonna leave the question of people's religious faith and worship between them and God and we're not gonna get the government involved in it. The government is gonna be involved in public things that are empirically knowable, unlike the matters of mystery dealing with you know, faith and religious belief. Um, Jared and I still have to deal with this struggle on an almost daily basis, and especially Jared, because he's been such a great leader on this now. But um, you know, in the Judiciary Committee recently, one of our colleagues began ranting about uh, Engel versus Vitale, which is the Supreme Court decision, which found that it, it violates the Establishment Clause to have teachers and principals lead students in religious prayer to compose prayer and then, you know, have everybody participate. And my colleague was railing about how this was the moral downfall of America when Engel versus Vitale was decided and the Supreme Court banned prayer in the public schools, to which I said the Supreme Court did not ban prayer in the public schools. As long as there are pop math quizzes, there will be prayer in the public schools. Anybody can pray whenever he or she wants to pray. It's just that the school authorities can't compel you to participate in a religious exercise. But what you do at your school lunch table, at your locker, before a test, before a football game, that's up to you. You know, you can, you can practice your French conjugation verbs, you can pray, you can meditate, whatever it might be. But the other point I want to make is that the principal way that the assault on the separation of church and state is taking place during the Trump period is the repeated efforts to claim that corporate entities and the government have a right to discriminate against the LGBT community and others as an exercise of religious freedom. And this too has old roots in the country. When the Civil Rights Act of 64 was uh, passed and it struck down um, segregation in interstate 
restaurants, lunch counters, hotels, motels, and so on. The claim was made by lots of the you know, motel owners and lunch counter owners. This violates our First Amendment religious freedom because our religion tells us that blacks and whites should not be sitting, seated together when they eat, or we don't have to serve interracial couples because that violates our religious rights. And the Supreme Court in a series of cases, Heart of Atlanta, uh, Motel, Ali's Barbecue, struck it all down, rejected all of those First Amendment arguments and said that under the civil rights laws, which are legitimately adopted under Congress's Commerce Clause power, we have the authority to make places of public accommodation serve everybody. But now today we get the same argument that's just been laundered and put into the language of the, you know, the Trumpians, which is, well, you're, when you make me serve at our restaurant a gay couple, or you make us uh, in our catering service serve a gay wedding, you are violating our religious freedom. Well, if you're a corporation that operates in the stream of commerce as a place of public accommodation, you've got to serve everybody. If not, if you're right that you don't have to serve gay people because you don't believe in gay people, um, then you also shouldn't have to serve interfaith couples, interreligious couples, interracial couples. We go back to all of that because uh, everybody's rights are unitary in that sense. All of us have a right against being discriminated against um, in the stream of public commerce. There was this woman who was a clerk of court or a deputy clerk of court who was saying, I don't have to issue marriage licenses to gay couples now that, that gay people can get married. Well, you're right, you don't have any obligation to do that, but you also don't have to have the job of being an assistant clerk of court then, because that's what your job is. And if you've got the right to pick and choose who you want to be, you want to allow to be married, you can also pick and choose you don't want inter faith couples to get married or interracial couples to get married or anybody you don't like to get married. You've just appointed yourself a king or a queen uh, at that point. So that can't be right. But this is the principal fight that we are having with them right now. All right, let's open it up uh, for questions to our marvelous panel here. Uh, Maddie, are you calling people or Paul, are you doing it? Yeah, uh, our fellows submitted a lot of questions, but our first one is from Abby and I believe it's for Rabbi Saperstein. Hi, my name is Abigail Leibowitz. I'm a rising senior at Northwood High School from Silver Spring, Maryland. And thank you all so much for talking with us today. So my question is for Rabbi Saperstein. The intersection of Jewish concepts with social change is something I've always been really passionate about. I've even published a few articles about it. My latest one titled Passover COVID-19 and the Plight of Refugees. In what ways has your Jewish identity motivated your social action? I, I really thank you for the question, Abby, and I thank you for your own passion um, about uh, social justice. Um, from the time that in, uh, in biblical times that we were taught um, that God had called the Jewish people to uh, be a holy people, um, to uh, be God's partner in shaping a better world. Um, think of those words in Leviticus 19, uh, where it says, you should be holy like the eternal, your God is holy. And how does God tell us we should do it? By feeding the hungry, by setting aside the corner of the field, by setting up fair courts, by having a fair marketplace, by protecting the rights, the, uh, uh, the wages of uh, fair and timely wages for the laborer um, uh, here. All of these things are what it means to be like God, to visit the sick, um, uh, here to tear apart the chains of the oppressed, in the words of uh, Isaiah, to bring the homeless into our homes. Those are literally the words of the Bible, shaping what it means to have a prophetic witness um, to the world. And it's shared by Islam, it's shared by Christianity, that idea of having a prophetic witness um, here. It's a very powerful theme in all of the Abrahamic tra traditions and in some of the Eastern traditions uh, as well. And it is as, and the ideas behind it, the moral ideas are as accessible to those who are not believers as easily as they are to those who are. That's what America did. In its aspirational document, it said, we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. But when it turned to the constitution, it did not do it depending on God. 
um, at all. It would, did it within the reason discourse to assume that there were certain fundamental rights beyond majoritarian rules, speech, press, right, uh, the right to determine our destiny um, uh, here, the right to protest, the right of the press, the right to exercise religion. All of these are beyond majoritarian rule as fundamental rights, but it has to work within the sculpture of law and the structure um, of law. And one of America's greatness was for, to protect religion by allowing these, uh, these um, rights not to be legally rooted in a religion, but accessible to everyone, religious, non-religious people of any religion. So those ideas Judaism gave to the world um, through the, uh, the, what the Christians call the Old Testament, call the, the Hebrew scriptures, um, those ideas are resonant in America um, and the kind of work that you do with that Jewish sensibility is also a powerful American sensibility. And I'm glad to see you merge them together um, by talking about what Judaism has to say to the great moral issues of your life and your country. Thank you, Ambassador Saperstein. Thank you, Abby, for everything that you do. We know you're a big time activist in our neighborhood. All right, next one, Matt. Great, absolutely. We have Dylan here for the next question. Hello, Dylan. Hi, I'm, I'm Dylan. I'm from Gaithersburg, Maryland. I'm a rising sophomore at Washington College. Um, so this question is a little bit geared towards Reverend Gerbesi and Rabbi Saperstein, but of course, Representative Huffman, if you want to answer, go ahead, obviously. Um, so we talk a lot about the religious right, but I wanted to kind of turn that on its head and ask about the religious left. Why do you think that there isn't as much of a religious left as there is a right? And with young prominent leaders like AOC and Pete Buttigieg rising in prominence who attribute a lot of their morality to religion, do you think that the religious left is on the rise? So can I start start with that? Um, Please. Rabbi um, so Dylan, I'm so glad you asked that. I don't actually think the religious left is smaller. What I think is that the religious left seeded the public voice and the public airwaves decades ago, probably back in the 1970s, when the religious right began, um, you know, television and radio religious programming. I think that the religious left or mainline Protestant Christianity in the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church also has a very strong social justice component, really seeded that public voice. So part of what happened over decades is that what was sort of generally recognized in the public square was this idea that Chris, the, the Christianity that people knew was the Christianity that was really available for public consumption. And part of the way I know that's true is I can't tell you for how many years I would be driving to work listening to somebody talk about the Christian position on something that bore no resemblance to my understanding of Christianity. So I do think that the pro that progressive Christianity is, is actually a lot bigger, but, but it's not got as united a voice. If you are interested in it, I have a friend named Jack Jenkins, who's a reporter, who's put out a book called American Prophets. And it's actually about progressive Christianity and its influence on politics, the social justice movement and all those things that have long ago, as Congressman Raskin said at the beginning, undergirded a lot of our, um, well, and as Rabbi Saperstein said, these universal moral ideas of helping others, of committing yourself to a life of service and care for the poor and the hungry and the sick are universal ideas that that progressive Christianity has long supported, but we didn't necessarily do it in the name of Christianity so much as in the name of good governance and, and the right thing to do. And we seeded the religious voice in the public square. Very nice. Uh, Rabbi Saperstein, did you want to add something? You know, just another way to think about exactly what you said, but to turn it on its head. If you think about who the great coalition of decency was in the United States in the first half of the 20th century, it was the Christian communities, the mainline 
Roman Catholic and uh, Protestant uh, communities, the labor unions, the civil rights groups, the NAACP, the Urban League, like the SCLC um, uh, here, and the Jewish community. And many people work through their churches and synagogues um, within that. The success of those efforts to transform America, particularly in the civil rights movement um, uh, here, led to the splintering of all kinds of secular groups um, here. All of the economic justice groups, the housing groups, the, the uh, hunger groups, the healthcare groups, all of the environmental groups, the endangered species groups, and 50 other kinds of groups, all the women's rights groups, the reproductive rights groups, the voting rights groups, uh, et cetera, all of the different civil rights groups, all of those, but who are the members of those groups? Who are the staff of those groups? Who are the donors of those groups? Who are the board members of those groups? They're the members of our synagogues, our churches, our mosques, our temples um, uh, here, or secular people of America who are also shaped, if not they, or very often their parents or grandparents by some of the same um, uh, uh, values and ethics we think that to be universal and accessible to all people um, uh, here. Those people, so we still have a very powerful presence, but you're right, as organized religion, they don't need our churches and synagogues to work through anymore. And we did see the ground um, here, you know, in, in, in those days, in the first half, who were the authentic religious voices? Martin Luther King and Stephen S. Wise and John mm -hmm. Haynes Holmes and John Courtney Murray and Pope John the 23rd. Um, uh, here and uh, uh, here and go down the list of Muslim and uh, and Christian and Jewish leaders around the world who represented these moderate uh, expressions of religion. Um, here today, the media equates authenticity with fundamentalism in every religion, and mm -hmm. we really have been edged out. And one of the things I hear um, uh, uh, Reverend Jean calling us to is it's time for us to take back that authentic centerpiece of religion that is so desperately needed here, not instead of all of the secular groups that spun off because of our work, but to complement those groups and mutually strengthen each other. Huh. That's fascinating. Jared, how do you respond to that conversation? Yeah. Thanks. So uh, what I would say, Dylan, is I, I don't think there's a religious left that is um, rising up. I think there is a coalition of inclusion and tolerance that includes all kinds of people of faith, but also includes people like me that are non-religious. And in fact, uh, if, if anything is ascendant in this country right now, uh, it that's it, that's the demographic. All the data suggests our country is becoming less religious. Uh, and yet I think these values of tolerance and inclusion, both of the members of faith that are in this conversation describe them as universal. And I would agree, uh, the way they articulate it comes from a place of faith, but those are my values too. Uh, and I mm -hmm. think that is descendant, uh, and it's a powerful political force. One of the things- the, uh, Let me just add one thing here. Um, the, the, I've read an interesting book once by Harold Bloom at Yale called The American Religion. And basically the thesis was that the real American religion is that people have their own relationship to God, which is kind of that Madisonian point too. And um, that is something that is pretty uniquely American. In a lot of countries, what it means to be religious is to belong to a particular corporate entity or body, and you go there and you do that, but it's not about you and God interacting. But I think that that is something that is, you know, very characteristic of the American experience. I think that that's why you know, precisely as Rabbi Zabersheim was saying, we've separated church and state and we've allowed a free marketplace of religion to prevail. Religions are always changing. There's new religions coming on. And I mean, you know, Mormonism was a new religion that was made up in the 19th century. You know, I mean, just like every religion gets made up at a certain point, it gets created and revealed. Um, but uh, so, but I'm curious, you know, that both, uh, you know, both R Reverend, um, uh, Gerbasi and um, Rabbi Saperstein represent very traditional religions, but they themselves are part of religions that are evolving. And it's almost like there's also this struggle within each religion where you get the more fundamentalist, strict, originalist, if you will, version of the conservative version of the religion. And then you get progressives within the religion saying, 
that that the religion has got to be meaningful to the times and to the people today. Um, and and I think that the, the secularists have also evolved in terms of a whole bunch of issues. I read the the secular magazines that come to my uh, office the, religiously, you'd say, uh, and you know, a lot of them are just saying, we've got to deal with racism and we've got to deal with sexism within the secular movement, you know, which is a fascinating thing. Jamie, can I just say a word to the uh, the secular uh, piece of it? First of all, the lines are not very bright lines. Uh, Many of the people who identify as secular are spiritually questing in the same way that religious uh, uh, people are. Many who say I'm none of the above um, uh, in America may um, believe in God. They uh, or may believe in something beyond themselves uh, uh, about it. It's it's what one of the great changes that's happened domestically and internationally is that international religious freedom today almost universally now makes it absolutely clear it applies to all religion and none and no religion um, here. And just as John Paul Stevens once observed that it used to be when we talked about religious freedom was not preferencing any Christian group other than another Christian group. Today, though, it means all religions, including those who hold no religion at all. All of them have equal rights. That's been the transformation of American jurisprudence as well. Um, uh, here, we're all in this together um, uh, here, and we all have access to the same ethics uh, that America needs right now. That's, That's the right. coalition that Representative Huffman is calling for. That's great. Okay, let's go to the next one, Maddie. All right, our next question is from Lynn. Hi, I'm Lynn. I'm from Silver Spring, Maryland, and I'm a rising junior at Oberlin College. And my question is open to any of you, and it's, why do you think members of the religious right and religious progressives have such different takeaways from the teachings of shared religions? So can I speak to that? Please, please, please. I think that um, the religious right, roughly, again, I'm summarizing, has a theology that focuses on individual salvation and that it has a particular look to it. So, you know, you say the Jesus prayer or whatever. And those, that theology leads to this idea that it's all about me and my relationship with God. And it's all about who I am and who's in and who's out. And it makes all that very easy. A more progressive Christianity, which I would say is not actually newer. So in this context, the more fundamentalist Christianity does not mean more orthodox or older or more pure, but, but a more progressive Christianity looks at a big, much bigger picture about salvation being about God saying God created everything in God's image and it's all good. And one day all of it will be redeemed. All of it is loved. It's, it's a, um, it's a much more universal look. It cares about the environment. It cares about every human being, every animal, everything. So, so I, my, part of my religious faith has me honor the dignity of every human being. So I don't feel threatened when somebody's of no religion. I don't feel threatened when somebody has a different religion. Part of my religious faith is loving and respecting every human being, but it is also about the idea that every human being matters so much that we have to do everything we can to make everyone and every creature and the entire environment be as healthy and as productive and as generative as possible. Hmm. So, and that would include sort of a policies about justice instead of law and order and healing instead of just a health insurance system. You know, it, it undergirds things that matter deeply in the public square. But part of my religious belief includes a, a, just a real openness and acceptance and love of others. Does that answer, does that address your question at all? I'm, I'm gonna mute myself now. All right, great. Rabbi Saperstein, did you wanna add anything to it? Yeah, I think no. uh, well said. Uh, just w- w- one footnote to something you just said, uh, Reverend Gervasi, which is uh, I saw a sign actually in Lafayette Square, which said justice um, is on the side of real law and order. Um, yeah, 
law and order is about power, who has it and who it's being kept from. And yeah. law and order also implies violence or threat of violence to keep it. And it needs a constant holding down. Justice is a, is a and I'm sorry, Rabbi Saperstein to borrow this, but is a shalom, a rep of forces at rest, a there's peace because the forces are in agreement. They're at rest, mm -hmm. there's a settledness. Justice is incredibly different from law and order. Law and order mm -hmm. is what people in power want. At the time that Jesus of Nazareth lived, the rabbis of the Talmud observed that the sword enters the world because of justice delayed and justice denied um, uh, here. That speaks across the centuries as powerfully to us today as it did to Jesus of Nazareth uh, 2,000 years ago. Great. Let's go to the next one, then. Okay. Uh, next up, we have Hannah. Hi. My name is Hannah Frank. Um, I am a rising sophomore at Wilson High School. So first of all, I just want to thank you all so much for coming and speaking to us today. And my question I pose to all three of you, because I think you probably all have um, some good insight into it and some unique insight into it. So my question is, why has Trump, a man who cannot in any way be described as religious and in fact quite the opposite, you know, from gambling, being overtly greedy, um, cheating, all that, why does he have such a wide appeal to the religious right? There's the $64 million question I've been waiting for. Thank you, Hannah Frank. Uh, let's start with Jared Huffman on that one. What do you think? Well, thanks for that uh, great question. I think we've all scratched our heads about that one, uh, Hannah, because you're right. Uh, there is such a, an obvious disconnect between who this man is. He's so amoral. Uh, he has lived a life that is anything but virtuous, and yet uh, he commands this, this loyalty. Uh, politically, at least, from uh, the religious right. I have heard colleagues of ours in the Congress, Jamie, um, who I know didn't start out liking Donald Trump. They, they despised him. And yet they've sort of one by one fallen in line and come to some sort of an accommodation. And the way I've heard many of them uh, articulate it uh, is through their religious lens. They believe that God chooses unlikely messengers to do his work. Uh, our, our Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, has compared uh, Donald Trump to um, Queen Esther in the Bible, who, I guess, in a very brutal and bloody way, protected Israel from the Persians. And he believes that God is now working through Donald Trump in, in sort of a, a sequel uh, to that episode where uh, Trump will protect Israel from uh, Iran. Uh, now, there's all sorts of dark and, and scary implications to that type of thinking and to dragging it into our foreign policy. Uh, but I really do think that um, folks on the religious right and certainly the colleagues we serve with them, to the extent I've been able to draw them out in our conversations, tend to think that God in this most unlikely way is somehow working through Donald Trump because he's doing the things they want him to do. He's appointing all of these crazy right wing judges. Uh, he is absolutely... Uh, opposed to abortion. And uh, I, I think it's as simple as that. Now, the white grievance and the, the racism, I'm sure, is a huge part of it as well. But that's, mm -hmm. that's a strange cocktail that he has created. Rabbi Saperstein, what's your take on it? I would just say I agree with everything that the congressman said. Um, here, I would just simply add um, uh, here that the white Christian America, the, about which many people in America romanticized, frightened by the changes that diversity is, has wrought to America, that some celebrate and embrace and see as the strength of America. Others are really frightened that they're gonna be left out. And when you're scared, you look for people who offer easy answers um, uh, here and come up and say, I can make America great again. Um, uh, here, well, that would be a relief to get back to where we were, an absolute impossibility. Um, uh, here, we are changed forever. Um, uh, here, we can make something wonderful of that. Um, here, we can be frightened and fight against it and tear the country apart. Um, uh, here, and too many have chosen the latter um, in this regard. In the end, I think they will pay a terrible political price and will wreak a terrible um, communal, cultural, 
Latin common wheel um, uh, price on uh, on America. Can I add one more thing? My means, um, Madeline here. Madeline Albright is one of my parishioners, and I saw her speaking recently, and she said that um, Mussolini is alleged to have said that if you pluck a chicken one feather at a time, no one notices. I think that this is part of what has happened, is that very gradually over time, evangelical, right-wing evangelical Christianity began to slide down a slippery slope and pluck feathers off of a chicken. Mm. So that eventually it was only one more feather and one more feather. And now they, some, realize that they may have gone too far but it only was one last feather you know what i mean yeah and but let me just add one point to that hannah um i you know at first it might seem indeed like a paradox um if you assume that um right-wing religion is about um theological belief or liturgical practice or individual salvation but if you assume that the purpose of right-wing religion is power, then it makes all the sense in the world that right-wing religion would align itself with Donald Trump, who's promising he will give the most extreme right-wing elements of the Republican Party, whoever they want, for the judges at every level and for the Supreme Court at every level, in order to impose more authoritarian agendas, especially on women against the LGBT community with respect to race, and so on. So if you if you read The Handmaid's Tale or watch The Handmaid's Tale, you will see the ultimate destination of right wing religion in America, which is to marry itself with forms of corporate and military power to control the, the people. And then it doesn't seem like that much of a mystery. Mm -hmm. It seems uh, perfectly normal. And, you, you know, because you can ask the question, why have so many churches gotten wrapped up? with financial exploitation? Why have so many churches gotten wrapped up with sexual exploitation and violence against children and on and on and on? Well, like any other institution, a church can be corrupted by people who want to use it for the exercise of illegitimate power over other people. And All it right. ends up corrupting both, the church and the power. It ends up corrupting both. Yeah, and, and, and that was precisely what, you know, Madison and Jefferson were saying. You have the union of church and state. You degrade religion, you impoverish religion, and you corrupt the affairs of state. You mess up the rule of reason, science, empiricism with all of these other agendas, these partial agendas. All right, Maddie, let's come back to you. All right, I just want to do a time check. It is 4.05. Oh, we better just do one more question and we'll let our distinguished guests go go on back to Saving America, of course. All right, so our last question is from Kayla. Hi, I'm Kayla Song and I'm a rising junior at Winston Churchill High School. And I just wanted to thank all panelists for coming out to speak to us today. Um, I personally have been brought up by um, religious values and I wanted to ask what are some ways that your religious values have created you into an agent for change and how do you face those who use religion as a justification for hate? But I'm not sure everybody could hear the very last sentence. Kayla, just would you repeat your question louder one more time so everybody can get it? Um, in addition to that, I asked how do you face those who use religion as a justification for hate? And if you don't mind, if you guys could each use this as a part of a closing, a concluding remark, you know, what do you say precisely to the religious right, which is now using religion and religious belief as an instrument of hate? Thank you for that wonderful question, Kayla. And oh, uh, can please, I Reverend so I don't have to have the last word. I, I feel like I wanna give one of the others the, the last word. Um, it is hard to, um, especially when my religious values call me to love, love my enemy. It is hard to respond to hatred with love and compassion. Um, my sense of justice requires that I stand up for people who don't have a voice. 
or that I stand up for people who have been marginalized. So my best way to try to do that is to do like what I'm doing here today is to be, my faith also says, invites me to speak the truth in love. So my goal is to do the best I can to speak what I see as the truth and name the truth of what's happening, the use of violence, the corruption of both government and religion with this, this false wedding, but this historic pattern we have of wedding um, religious fervor with political power. I, it's part of my faith to speak against that and, and to do so in the context of people who are being more marginalized, people who are being oppressed. And so right now that's, that's people of color, which includes all those people incarcerated at the border. So, so that is how I am using my religion right now. And what I say back to people who are using hate is to ask them, how does their, how does the fruits of what they're doing show love for neighbor, which is what underlies my faith? So now I'll put on my mute. Um, thank you very much for th that terrific presentation and all of your thoughts today. And thank you for your bravery in uh, weathering that police assault. Um, yeah. So thank you for, for participating, uh, Reverend Kerbasi. Uh, Congressman Huffman. Thank you for not uh, putting all the pressure of the last word on me. I want the rabbi to have that. I know he's up to the, the task. Um, you know, my feeling is that notions of right and wrong and love and truth and all of these values that we're talking about really are universal. These are part of um, the, the moral framework of any good human being. I'm a humanist, uh, so I'm a non-theistic um, a moralist, you might say, and, and humanists believe in good without God, but all of the values um, are, are very much aligned with the things that you've heard from the Reverend, Reverend and the rabbi. So um, how Trump and, and some in the religious right managed to twist what are otherwise, uh, you know, great universal values and weaponize them in very hateful ways, um, I don't know, but I guess I would I would just say I think he has jumped the shark. I think he is such an opportunist and such a demagogue that even within the evangelical right wing that that was so useful to him uh, for these past several years, uh, they have been disgusted at some of the things that he's done, uh, separating families at the border. Uh, frankly, on, on immigration, many evangelicals are, are really quite ethical and quite strong and would agree with us on many aspects of what a progressive immigration policy should look like. And I think they've started to connect the dots about just how cravenly this demagogue has used them, uh, playing the abortion card, uh, playing uh, the, the card that recognizes that they've had a, a hard time with the speed and the pace of social change. Uh, but, but I think we're at a moment where he has so overplayed his hand that even many of them, at least the thoughtful ones uh, and, and the ethical and the moral ones, uh, are, are falling away and, frankly, should be working with us uh, in what is one of the biggest landslide elections in many, many years. Uh, so thank you uh, for the opportunity to be with such thoughtful and, and wonderful people. Jamie, thank you for all of your great leadership and to the, the fellows and other participants in, in your seminar here. I'm just so impressed and, and honored to have been a part of it. Thank you, Congressman Hoffman. And we, we will be calling on you many times in the future to come back. Thanks for your uh, extraordinary leadership, which is moving the people across the country. Uh, Rabbi Saperstein, you get to go last and maybe I'll have a couple of words just of thanks to everybody. So you know, I, I was tempted, uh, Representative, and as you were saying about a landslide victory, to simply uh, quip from your lips to God's, and then I thought better of. Uh, um, Kayla, did I under did I hear you correctly? That when you asked in the beginning, the first half of yours was asked how our religion, our re or our religious values, um, motivated us to be involved, or did I mishear you? Oh yeah, I said that. I you did. Asked, okay, so um, let, me, let me, uh, yeah. uh, so a quick a, a quick set of answers. One, um, there's a strand of Jewish theology 
that argues that when God created the universe, God chose to leave one part of creation undone, the creation of a world of justice and peace. And then in our sacred text gave us a blueprint to how to finish that world of, uh, of justice and peace and in allowing, giving us freedom of choice and the ability to choose between good and evil, um, the ability to bring about that, career, that world of justice and peace. And in allowing us to be partners with God, God has ennobled humanity, raises above mere and biological existence and given to our lives meaning and destiny and purpose. So for me, if you ask me, how do my religious values shape what I do, the public service I've done, the efforts, the social justice efforts I've done, I feel like I'm completing that world of justice and peace that God has called me to, um, uh, to do. Um, and I would say, um, uh, Reverend Trebezi, that your point about religion seeding this, I would also say democratic elected officials are too often seated, um, their own religious sensibilities um, uh, to people on the conservative uh, side here. You can't understand Joe Biden unless you understand his deep religious faith. Um, it's crucially important to him. And it's, important, and it's likely to be as important to liberal candidates as it is to conservative candidates. Um, and I hope that there's uh, the ability to recapture that um, in a more natural um, and effective way um, uh, moving forward. But this I know above all for all the young people on here, as I listen to this and I think about leaders like Representative Huffman or Representative Raskin, um, we are not the prisoners of a bitter and unremitting past. We can be, we must be. And with people like you, we will be the shapers of a better and more hopeful future for all God's children. On the religious side, I know if the religion we offer the young does not speak to the great moral issues of their lives of the world that they will inherit from us, it will not inspire them. But on your side, you can help create that world of justice and peace. And I look forward to working with all of you to achieve that. Rabbi Saperstein, thank you for those beautiful words and thank you for uh, your exemplary leadership. Um, in the religious world and across the whole country and across uh, the globe in your work as an ambassador for religious freedom. Um, I was uh, thinking as, as you said it, that um, in this presidential contest, uh, the, um, the hallmark of authentic religious faith is definitely with the liberal candidate over the conservative candidate um, in this case. And uh, as we were saying, you know, uh, if, if Trump has some support in the religious community, it has nothing to do with his uh, religious worship, faith, or practice. It's all about power. Um, but th let me just, I, I would like to say uh, two words of, clothing, of closing also in response to Kayla's question. One is, um, you know, it's been uh, a primary commitment of great religious and political leaders of all beliefs that love finally is stronger than hate. That's what Dr. King said explicitly that love is stronger than hate. I know that our late beloved colleague, uh, John Lewis, also was very determined in his belief in that principle. It's, you know, it's not just that hate and violence are destructive, but also they don't work as well. Now, th that's not foreordained, that's not predestined, that's up to us to show that love is stronger than hate and that we can make love a more powerful force in the world. And the way that love manifests, of course, in society is through justice. It is through giving everybody an equal share in the destiny of our society. Um, I want to close by telling you guys a joke I learned when I went over to Ireland uh, about a guy who's speeding down the highway. Um, I think I've told this to my friend Jared because I tell him jokes all day long. But uh, he's speeding down the highway. So the cop sees him and turns on his siren and starts chasing the guy down. He pulls him over the side of the road and then, you know, raps on his window. He, the guy rolls his win window down and the cop says to him, are you Catholic or are you Protestant? And the guy says, I'm an atheist. And then the cop says, Catholic atheist or Protestant atheist? <laughs> um, and the reason I love that joke is because it tells you that in the hands of a lot of people, religion is primarily about tribalism. It's like, which team are you on? And uh, what I love about our panel today is we have people 
who are fighting for the very best in religion, which is not about tribalism, it is about universalism, and is about vindicating their interpretation of God's mission for all of the world. But we also see from Congressman Huffman the absolute best of humanism, which he also presents not as a form of sectarianism and not as a as a critique or a complaint against religious people, but as an attempt to lift up the best values and the best rights that people have fought for in the civilizing movements of the past. So thank you, Congressman Huffman. Thank you, Ambassador Saperstein. Thank you, uh, Reverend Kerbasi, for your uh, magnificent leadership. And thanks to all these Democracy Summer fellows who truly deeply appreciate your coming out and talking to them. And as you can tell, all of them are thanking you for engaging with young people who are about to inherit a world with a whole lot of problems and they need the best wisdom and they're getting it from you guys. So thanks to all of you and thanks to the Democracy Summer Fellows. Thank you, Paul Ellis. Thank you, uh, Maddie. Thank you, all of the staff for what you're doing. And we'll see you next week. Bye everybody. Bye.